Mr. President. Senator from Michigan. Mr. President, uh, I see that uh, Senator Webb is on the floor, and I know that he uh, is going to be uh, making some remarks uh, in a few moments, and I would just urge other colleagues of ours to do the same thing. We are in a period now where debate is uh, in order on any of the amendments, uh, whether they are pending or not pending, whether they've been filed and not been made pending. Uh, and uh, this is an opportunity uh, which is going to end, hopefully, uh, on uh, Wednesday morning when we vote cloture. We must get this bill passed. It is critically important to our men and women in uniform. Uh, and um, they deserve to have a defense authorization bill passed. And so I would urge colleagues who have amendments uh, that they have filed to come to the floor this afternoon uh, to debate their amendments. And I yield the floor. Senator from Virginia. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that Neely Marcus Silby of Senator Murray's staff be granted floor privileges for the duration of the 112th Congress. Without objection. Uh, Mr. President, I uh, rise as the subcommittee chairman of the Personnel Subcommittee on the uh, Armed Services Committee to speak on uh, our bill. And I'd like to uh, begin. Uh, our, my comments on this national defense authorization by uh, saying what a privilege and an honor it has been to work with Chairman Levin and Senator McCain. Uh, I say this as a, someone who spent four years as a committee counsel uh, in a, another era and then another five years in the Pentagon, four of them as an Assistant Secretary of Defense and Secretary of the Navy working, working with the Congress and finally as a member of the Senate. I believe that uh, uh, Chairman Levin is the epitome of what a uh, chairman, full committee chairman and Senate should be. And I've known Senator McCain for many, many years, as one would expect. We haven't agreed on, on uh, some uh, political issues, but I have also enormous regard for uh, Senator McCain as well. I'd like to also thank all the members of the personnel subcommittee and especially ranking member, uh, member Senator Graham for the work that they have done in preparing this legislation and also uh, like to thank our staff, Gary Leeling, John Clark, Bree Eisen for all the hard work that they have done in order to bring this bill forward. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have a, uh, a longer floor statement with respect to the personnel subcommittee's actions that I would ask to be submitted in the record at this time. Without objection. I would uh, point out that uh, uh, we've done the best job that we can do in terms of bringing uh, a bill to the floor that will take care of uh, the needs of the men and women who serve in our military and the national security needs of our nation. And I know that we're going to go into a period here um, pretty soon where we're going to be going through the defense budget as well as the other areas of uh, the expenditures of this country. And I just hope people will keep in mind as we start making comparisons uh, with military service versus civilian service uh, that military service really is unique in this country in, in more ways than sometimes we recognize. Um, I remember when I first came to the Senate, uh, hearing the report of the Dole Shalala Commission on military compensation, and there was a great deal of comparison with respect to how they developed compensation analysis in the uh, civilian sector. And something that we have to uh, remember when we look at the areas of uh, the United States military, particularly on the, on the uh, uh, manpower personnel side, is that you can't pick your job. Uh, many, many people come in because they want to spend a portion of their life serving their country. Uh, you can't decide, if you don't like who you're working for, that you want to leave. You can't quit your job. You can't decide you don't want to be transferred if they're sending to a place you don't want to go. And, by the way, you might get shot at, blown up, or killed. Uh, this is uh, kind of a unique environment. We tend to forget this uh, when uh, budget cuts come or when the hostilities 
fade away. But we have an obligation up here to be the stewards, the lifetime stewards of the people who have stepped forward and put themselves on the line on behalf of our country. There are provisions uh, in this authorization bill that relate particularly to our basing system in Asia. I've spent a good part of my life working on these issues, uh, and I'd like to say right at the outset here that I uh, strongly advocate a strategy-driven review of all our bases around the world. I think we need to do a zero-sum analysis based on our uh, strategy as to which bases we should keep in operation and which ones perhaps we shouldn't. But there is a unique situation that uh, exists uh, at the moment in terms of the vital interest that we have as the key balancing force in Asia. Uh, and we have been working on this. We have developed a chairman, uh, Senator McCain, myself, worked uh, very hard on this to develop language in this legislation that would call for uh, an independent review of the basing uh, proposals that have been on the table in uh, Korea and Okinawa and Guam. And particularly with the situation on Okinawa, this has become uh, an issue that's larger than simply uh, American military bases in Japan. Uh, it, the inability of uh, our two governments to have come up with a workable solution to the basing system on Okinawa has created uh, one of the uh, most difficult domestic political situations inside Japan today. This has been going on for 15 years. There have been 15 years of uncertainty. Uh, we need to move forward on this in a timely manner. It can't be kicked down the, the road any longer. Uh, we have a formula inside uh, this authorization bill which will allow uh, independent eyes to come in and do an analysis of where these bases need to go, uh, sort of a step away from the, uh, the turf protection that one often sees uh, among the military services in, inside the, uh, the Pentagon. Um, there is also going to be considered, possibly as early as, as later today, uh, an amendment that will um, allow the Chief of the National Guard Bureau to become a full member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, I oppose this amendment. Uh, I'm going to take some time to explain this. I, I realize this is a uh, a moving train. I think we have 70 co-sponsors on this bill. Um, but I have offered a second degree amendment which basically would say, let's take a time out. Let's get another look at this. Uh, let's look at the, the potential implications of putting the Chief of the National Guard Bureau as a full member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, I say this as uh, someone who has, as all of us, a tremendous regard for what the National Guard has been doing, not only over the past 10 years, but through the course of our entire history. When one tends to forget because of the um, lack of the use of the National Guard during the Vietnam War, that our history uh, has been marked by uh, the instances of the National Guard stepping forward to serve during the war. They were the preponderance of our military uh, forces in World War I and World War II, once mobilization was declared. They sent 100,000 uh, people into Korea. Um, but this amendment, and again, I say this as someone who spent three years uh, as the principal advisor to the Secretary of Defense on Guard and Reserve programs when Cap Weinberger was, was Secretary of Defense. I was the first Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs. Um, the, the National Guard is a unique composite. Uh, to put the Chief of the National Guard Bureau as a full member um, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, in my view, and in the view of all of the Joint Chiefs and the Secretary of Defense, would be uh, confusing. Um, it would, uh, in the words of um, Secretary Panetta, um, would not improve upon this advisory function 
or advance the statutory purpose. Rather, it would introduce inconsistencies among the JCS members and potentially negatively affect the formulation of an integrated joint force by fostering the impression that the National Guard is a separate service. Uh, Mr. President, all of the chiefs agree on this position. In fact, the hearing that we had on this issue was the only hearing in modern memory where all of the Joint Chiefs showed up uh, to, to state their views. I would like at this time to uh, ask that the letters from the Joint Chiefs, uh, from the Secretary of Defense, and from two of the three service secretaries be entered into the record stating uh, that opposition. Without objection. Um, Mr. President, the administration also opposes this amendment. Um, Senator Graham mentioned during the um, committee hearing that candidate Obama at a National Guard Association convention expressed his support uh, for this idea, but President Obama has yet to offer his support for this idea. And in fact, the Secretary of Defense, as I mentioned, is, has stated his strong opposition. If the President uh, is inclined to support this idea, uh, perhaps he should clarify that for us. Um, the Chief of the National Guard Bureau already has extraordinary access uh, at the table. There have been some questions about bringing the National Guard to the table. He has extraordinary access at the table. He, in fact, is the only uh, chief of uh, any department in the, in the Pentagon who doesn't have to report through a service secretary. He reports to the, to the Secretary of Defense uh, right now. Um, the other reserve components report through service secretaries. Uh, the Army Reserve, as opposed to the Army Guard, the Air Force Reserve, the Navy Reserve, the Marine Corps Reserve, and the Coast Guard Reserve uh, through the uh, Coast Guard uh, process. They are all represented uh, at the table in the Joint Chiefs without having to be members of the Joint Chiefs. Um, I would remind my colleagues that what we are proposing here is statutorily doable if this body wishes to do it, but it is going to be uh, bureaucratically awkward in the Pentagon if it were to occur. You're going to put a position on the Joint Chiefs of Staff with an individual who is not a service chief. Now, during the committee hearings, Senator Graham and, and others mentioned an article that I had written in 1972 in the Marine Corps Gazette calling for the Commandant of the Marine Corps to become a full member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I actually was quite flattered that someone would recall an article that I wrote 39 years ago when I was a 25-year-old Marine Corps captain. Um, but the point of the article actually is the reverse of what we're talking about here today. The point of the article was that the Marine Corps was a separate service, a completely separate service. Uh, the Marine Corps wears a separate uniform than the Navy. The Marine Corps was being represented um, on the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the same way that, say, naval aviation was. Um, this is not true with the National Guard. The Air National Guard wears the uniform of the United States Air Force when they are mobilized. They are a part of the United States Air Force. The Army National Guard. Uh, wears the uniform of the United States Army. When they are brought into federal service, they're wearing the same uniform. We've made a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of this when I was Assistant Secretary for uh, Reserve Affairs, talking about one Army, uh, one Air Force. You can't tell the difference when, they're, when their uh, units are called up and they're put together. So what are we doing when we say that there should be a position on the Joint Chiefs of Staff of an individual who's not a service chief. What does that say, for instance, let's just think about this, uh, about Special Operations Command? You know, the Special Operations Command, a lot of people are writing about it right now because of the, the, the uh, activities that they have been doing over the past 10 years and the fact that they have pretty well quintupled uh, the people on the ground. The Special Operations Command is not a separate service. People are saying, people are writing, they act as a separate service, but they're made up of members of the other services. They're put together by the, the, the SINC, uh, and they are fed by the service chiefs based on policies developed at the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, 
Mr. President, in 1986, uh, going into 1987, when I was Assistant Secretary of Defense, there was a uh, constitutional confrontation that occurred when a lot of uh, governors in the United States were being pressured by political groups that did not uh, support a policy of uh, the Reagan administration in Central America. And what they started doing was lobbying the governors of the different states uh, in their role as commander of the militia, the National Guard, uh, saying that the governors shouldn't be sending National Guard troops, their militia, into Central America. At one point, Secretary Weinberger turned, up, turned around to me and he said, we have 40% of, of the National Guard in the United States potentially non-deployable to Central America because the governors in states like California and Ohio have said they weren't going to send their National Guard troops to Central America. Uh, we had a long and divisive argument over this. It took place for almost a year, and finally we worked with Sonny Montgomery, who was Mr. National Guard in the House of Representatives, for whom I had worked uh, years before. We got a piece of legislation that said the governor cannot do that. The governor, even though he or she is commander of the militia, cannot stop deployments when uh, the, the Pentagon decides they should deploy. Um, this went all the way to the Supreme Court, the National Guard lost, and we clarified in that Supreme Court decision the supremacy of the Army Clause of the Constitution over the Militia Clause of the Constitution. Basically, that the needs of the Army, the needs of the United States military, active duty military, when they're calling up these units, supersede the desires of a governor. Um, I would say that that principle still would be in effect today and, and still should be recognized today in the way that the National Guard uh, is fed into our uh, active duty Army units and, and Air Force units when they are being deployed. And they are well represented uh, on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Every member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff emphasized this, uh, and every one of them discussed the, uh, the confusion uh, and the potential inequality among other reserve components if this uh, amendment were to succeed. Um, I have enormous respect for Senator Leahy. I, I, I consider him to be a great friend. I know he's not particularly happy with the statement I'm making right now. But I hope that people will take a hard look at the amendment that I'm offering, which basically says let's take a time out, let's look specifically at the effects uh, that this uh, position, positioning of the Chief of Guard as, as a member of the Joint Chiefs would have on the principles of civilian control and accountability um, of someone who is not subject to the oversight of a confirmed Secretary of the Military Department and uh, a number of other, other issues. So uh, with that, Mr. President, uh, on the remainder of this bill, I express my uh, strong support, my respect and admiration for, for Chairman Levin, Senator McCain, and the other members of our committee, and I yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator from Oklahoma. I ask you now to speak as if in more business for 15 minutes. Without objection. Uh, <clears throat> I, I listened to parts of what uh, Senator Reid had to say as we opened the Senate today, and I was struck <clears throat> by the fact that so many people are unemployed and our economy is still barely growing that there probably is not any firm objections to trying to alleviate some of the pain by continuing a process where we lessen the tax burden through a decline in the Social Security tax. And I don't think that's going to be the issue with many senators. Uh, the question is, is, do we do that by raising taxes on other people or do we do that by getting rid of waste? And uh, I had an interesting phone call today with uh, somebody I trust and I've been talking to for three years who has actually predicted everything that's happened so far. And he's predicted what's going to happen in Europe and predicted the fact that ultimately there's going to be default in Europe on government bonds. There's going to be default. 
there's no way they grow themselves out of it. There's no way we loan them enough money to buy them enough time to get out of it. And the only way they get out of it is by trimming their spending, which they should have started two and a half or three years ago. Well, the same lesson applies to us. So I think some things that are factual ought to be brought up. And we had, the, the, over this past week, the inability of the committee to come to agreement on $1.2 trillion. And so, therefore, there's going to be a sequestration. But interesting thing on the way to the farm, when you have the sequestration carried out, the actual, there will be no decrease in spending to the federal government. This is an important thing I want the American people to hear. They think we're cutting spending. Defense will rise 16% with the sequestration. Non-defense discretionary will still rise 6%. Medicare will still rise 71%. Net interest will rise 160% with the sequestration. So it's dishonest, to put it mildly, to say that we're cutting anything in Washington. And there begs the problem. The problem is, is the political elite in this country is failing to make the adjustments that we have to make, or we're going to end up like Greece, Portugal, Spain, Italy, and ultimately France. We have to do that. The sooner we do it, the less pain we're going to have. So with the first thing we ought to do is be honest with the American people. Nobody has done anything in Washington yet to cut any spending. Because spending is still going to rise both in discretionary and defense, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. It's all going to rise, and so is interest. It's still going to rise. So we have to go back to the fundamental problem. What President Obama is proposing costs about $240 billion for next year. And I think he'd get great support from many of us if he said, I want to do this to help people out there, and I want to do it by getting rid of some of the waste, fraud, abuse, and duplication that we have. I'd be the first to help him. But that's not what's going to be proposed. And instead of playing the political game, why don't we actually solve the real problems? We had a GAO report that came out in March that showed massive duplication throughout the federal government. Massive. My estimate is close to $200 billion a year. That's not theirs, that's mine. But at a minimum, $100 billion a year could be saved just by consolidating programs and eliminating duplication. We haven't done anything. We haven't made any attempt to do that. We passed one, Senator Warner and myself offered one amendment to eliminate $5 billion of it, and the bill that it was writing on was withdrawn. We haven't had an opportunity on all the bills that have come before to get an amendment even up to offer to eliminate duplication. Before we ask anybody to pay more taxes to offset the taxes we're going to decrease for the businesses under $50 million, $50 million and the decline in the payment of Social Security tax to 3.1% for the business and 2% for the individual, the first thing we ought to do is get our house in order. And we're doing exactly what the European countries refuse to do. And now we hear over the weekend we're about to participate through the IMF in socializing the debt of Europe at which we are required through IMF to absorb 26% of the cost. We're not going to let that happen. Because what we're going to do is exactly the same thing we were doing with the cities, delaying the onset of the time at which they're going to have to make the hard choices. So we can't do that. But it's interesting. Here's the growth curve. In the red is with sequestration. In the blue is without sequestration. We're not cutting spending. It's still going up. We're going to be at $5.4 trillion annual budget in 2021, in nine years from now. So no spending has been cut. We need to quit lying to the American people about what we're doing. A 9% approval rate rating is well earned as long as we're dishonest with the American people about what we're actually doing. They understand the problem. We're broke. And if you don't think that's the case, just look. Medicare is broke. There's no question about it. Medicaid's broke. The census is broke. 
Fannie and Freddie are broke. Now FHA has 0.24% of the capital that they need when they have a minimum statutory requirement of 3%. They're broke. FHA. Social Security. It is broke. $2.6 trillion in the trust fund. We put $105 billion from the Treasury in to offset what we did this last year. And now we're going to pay for it twice because there was no decrease in the IOUs. So for that $105 billion, our children and grandchildren are going to pay back $210 billion. And with this new program, they're going to pay back $480 billion because there's not going to be any offset to the trust fund. The U.S. Post Office, it's dead broke. And we won't even pass a bill that allows it to be fixed. What we do is just delay the time of its demise. Cash for clunkers was broke. The highway trust fund is broke. We're passing bills for the highway trust fund that are $13 billion short. We don't know where the money's going to come from because the trust fund's broke. Government-run health care? We don't know, but it's likely to be broke before it starts. So how do we solve the problem? Well, uh, Senator Yield, just for a question real sure. quick. On the issue of the post office, not a big deal, but isn't it kind of a symptom of the disease we suffer from around here where we would not even agree to legislation that cuts mail delivery from six days to five, which is the recommendation of the Postmaster General? And the pr recommendation of the President of the United States. What about duplication? Is there not some place we can find the $240 billion that President Obama wants to put into the economy for helping those in the middle and lower income levels make it through this tough time? Sure there is. We have 100 plus surface transportation programs that can easily be consolidated down into 20. We have 82 federal teacher quality programs. Not one of them has a metric on it. We don't have any idea if it works. 82 economic development programs. We have 88. Transportation assistance programs outside surface transportation, we have 80 of those. We have 56 financial literacy programs. We have 47 job training programs, $18 billion a year. All but three overlap one another, and not one of them has a metric to say it works. Homeland, uh, homelessness prevention and assistance, 20 separate programs. There's nothing wrong with that goal. Why do we need 20? Food for the Hungry, we have 18 different programs. Couldn't we do that through one federal program? Why do we need to have 18? Disaster Response and Preparedness in FEMA, 17 different programs. We have taken a stupid pill. And now we sit bankrupt. We're physically bankrupt, fiscally bankrupt and physically bankrupt at this moment, except we just haven't recognized it. And what is happening in Europe is going to happen to us in less than a year. The price that we pay for our bond interest is going to go up. The price differential between a German and Italian bond in the last 10 days has risen 270 basis points. A spread of 200. They pay. Germany couldn't even sell all their bonds Friday. What is happening? It's a lack of confidence. So we have to restore confidence. So the way we do that is by actually paying for the good things we need to do by eliminating common sense, putting forth common sense solutions for elimination of programs that are duplicative. I'll finish up with just a couple other points. <coughs> just some ideas. If you started now, you could put the 2020 census online. You'd save $2 billion. Increase the paperless transactions at the Treasury Department. You could save $1 billion. That's a, these are per year, by the way, per year. Gradually increase for GSE securities. Obama, President Obama has started that, but it needs to be accelerated. Move the core function to the Election Assistance Commission to the FEC. It's $161 million. Bucks. We could just, you know, we could consolidate. We could do common sense things. We can combine the SEC and CFTC. We could save $2.8 billion. Move the SBA disaster loans to FEMA. You've got to go through FEMA anyhow before you ever qualify for one. Why not let them do it? Why would we have two separate programs? Two, why do you have to go to two doors? It would be like getting your driver's license down where you bought the car, and then you have to go somewhere else and get it, and then you have to go somewhere else. We could eliminate that. National Drug Intelligence Center. Doesn't do anything. It's an earmark. 
We spent $488 million on it the last 10 years. It does nothing of concrete value to anybody in the intelligence network. But it's an earmark gone crazy. So what do we do? Well, we put together a shopping list that you could use. You don't have to agree with any of it. But over the next 10 years, if you just agreed with a, th a third of it, you could find the third, you could save $3.3 trillion. All right? That's $85 billion more if we just did one-tenth of it this year than what the president would like to do with this job stimulus program. None of this is hard. There, there, there certainly can be some debate over what we fund and what we don't fund in defense, but most of it is common sense. And will people squeal? Yes. Everybody's going to have to squeal if we're to get out of the problem that we have in this country. So I'll conclude with this. I think we ought to continue until our economy's back on keel a Social Security tax cut. But I think the only way we should do that is by eliminating some of the $350 billion a year of waste, of duplication, and of fraud in the federal government. And if we can't do that, we shouldn't be here. None of us should be here. And the fact that the politics of the next election is crippling this country says that we deserve the 9% rating that the American people are giving us. All we have to do is change that. You know, what we have to do is grow a backbone, stand up and say no to people, say we've got to do this, it's for your future and for our kids' future. We, these are the things that are least painful. Here's what happens if we don't. The very people that we say we don't want to harm now by changing some of these multitude of duplications, all these other programs, all this waste, all this feel-good things that part of the time accomplish good things, those very people are going to suffer a significantly more amount because of our inaction. It's a time for us to act. It's time for us to do what is necessary to put our country back in the right direction and on a healthy diet of fiscal prudence, smart tax policy, and get out of the rut that we're in. That requires leadership by each of us. Not just the president, all of us. And it means you have to take some hits. When I put black and black out, I got terrible, nasty letters from all sorts of people. I understand. They're getting something. And it's, some of that is put at risk. And therefore, you can't represent them if you're going to put it. Everybody's going to have to give. And if everybody doesn't give, we won't have a country left. That's what's coming. Default. We're broke now. We're just not in the reality of it. But what is coming is default of American bonds if we do not act now. It can't wait two years. It can't wait for the next presidential election. We have to do it now. With that, I yield the floor. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Okaka.
As this quorum call continues on the floor of the U.S. Senate, the Senate gaveled in this afternoon at 1 o'clock, returning from their Thanksgiving break. Senators today working on defense programs and policy for fiscal year 2012. Coming up at about 5 o'clock, we expect the Senate to take up the nomination of Christopher Droney to be U.S. Uh, Circuit Judge for the Second Circuit. After about 30 minutes of debate on that, the Senate will uh, vote on that nomination. We'll then likely get back to work on defense programs legislation. By the way, Congress must pass nine more appropriations bills before a stopgap spending measure expires on December 16th. The House back in session tomorrow. They uh, will uh, return tomorrow, and you can see this, the House live, of course, on our companion network, uh, C-SPAN. Earlier this afternoon, Massachusetts Congressman Barney Frank announced that he will not run for re-election next year, citing issues with redistricting in his state. Congressman Frank has served 30 years. He's the ranking member of the House Financial Services Committee. Stepping down leaves second-ranking California Democrat Maxine Waters in line to become the senior Democrat on the committee should Democrats retake the House in the upcoming elections. Congresswoman Waters is currently under investigations for ethics violations. And you can read more about this in The Hill. Go to thehill.com. Consent that further proceedings under the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Mr. President, uh, here's where we're at. Uh, under the current UC that we're operating uh, under, the uh, debate is in order this afternoon, uh, and uh, we are urging that our colleagues who have amendments pending come and debate those amendments. Now, this is an opportunity uh, for them to do so, and this opportunity is not going to last uh, for very long because we've got to get this bill passed. So uh, I would urge, and I know my good friend from Arizona would join me in urging colleagues who have amendments, whether they're pending or not, we're not going to be able to have any additional amendments adding to the, added to the pending list uh, by unanimous consent because we already have something like 100 pending amendments. It just is more than we're going to be able to handle to add any more, and it may be more than we can handle to deal with the ones that are already pending. But uh, I just would urge colleagues. Uh, otherwise, you know, tomorrow we're going to be hearing from colleagues, gee whiz, we want to offer our amendment or we want to debate the amendment, and there won't be time before that cloture vote on Wednesday, and uh, we're not going to have more than uh, this week for this bill. We've been informed by the majority leader that uh, he wants to finish this bill by Thursday. So I strongly urge our colleagues to come and use this opportunity to uh, debate their amendments. It will increase the chances that we'll be able to get to their amendments for a vote. Uh, Mr. President. Senator from Arizona. I ask unanimous consent to engage in a colloquy with the distinguished chairman. Without objection. Isn't it true, I'd ask the chairman, that we went on this bill last Thursday and that we spent a good part of Thursday on this legislation? And then on Friday, you and I and a few others came in on Friday and we had further debate and discussion of amendments. And then we came in, I believe, around 1 o'clock um, today and enjoined our, in fact, pleaded with our colleagues to come and discuss their amendments they have pending. I understand there's some 100, over 100 amendments that are pending. And so it does ring a bit hollow 
if some of our colleagues uh, may say that they didn't have time to debate the amendments that are pending. So I, I would say to my, my colleagues, I believe and have stated uh, endlessly that this piece of legislation, which has to do with the nation's security, which has been passed by the Congress of the United States for over 50 years now, over a half a century without interruption, that we're doing a disservice to the men and women in the military. If we don't debate these amendments, if we don't discuss the important issues of national security that are embodied in this legislation. So I, I would ask my friend, the distinguished chairman, after these thousands of hours of work, and now on our fourth day of consideration of this bill, that maybe it might be appropriate um, for us to take measures to expedite the process so that, and again, I urge our colleagues who have pending amendments to come down, debate, discuss, and so that we can line up votes because there's so many pending amendments, it's going to require a significant number of votes as well. Well, I surely concur with uh, my colleague uh, that uh, we have uh, been here now. I think this is the fourth day. Uh, the days last week, which the senator referred to, I, are different from my own memory. I think they were earlier in the week than the senators uh, referred to, but nonetheless, the point's the same. It's the same. I, I believe we were here, it was either Tuesday or Wednesday, but there were two days before we left for Thanksgiving where we were here. And your point is well taken. Uh, the floor was open to debate. Uh, people offered amendments. They were had an opportunity to make them pending. And now we have a huge number of those amendments pending, and now it's time to start disposing of amendments. Uh, and unless our colleagues come to the floor to do that, uh, we're not going to be able to get through this bill, and the leader will not continue debate, uh, allow us to continue to debate this bill beyond Thursday. We know that that's the case because we know how much pending legislation there is that the majority leader uh, needs to get through. So I, I can only again uh, join uh, the Senator from Arizona in a joint plea that uh, our colleagues who have amendments come and debate those amendments and uh, hopefully we can get to uh, votes on those amendments uh, even yet today after the vote on the judge at 5.30 or so. So uh, my colleagues should not object to uh, short time agreements for debate, final debate, before we vote on some of these amendments. I hope that the, uh, when the time comes, when colleagues come to the floor, they'll understand that unless they agree to short time agreements, that there's no way we're going to be able to uh, get this bill done, even if their amendments pass. It will not do anyone any good to have long debates on amendments when people finally come to debate those amendments. Uh, even if the amendments pass, because uh, there won't be an opportunity to get the bill itself passed. So that is very true. Mr. President, I yield. I suggest the absence of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Thank you.